I take it that you're all interested in the subject of art, but how many times have you asked yourself the question, what is art and is it really necessary? Many people, of course, some, uh, know about art. Some people like it. Some people don't like it. Many people are not interested in it. But the question is, what is the role of art in society? Now, uh, nowadays, I think that very few people, perhaps even very few of you, would actually be prepared to say, no, no, art is necessary. For most people, art is uh, putting a pretty picture on the wall, which they may or may not look at occasionally. But this is hardly something, it may be nice, it may be pleasing, but it's hardly necessary. Food is necessary. Housing is necessary. Clothes are necessary. Is art really necessary? Now, I, I want to recommend uh, a book to you by a, a man called Ernst Fischer, which has the title, The Necessity of Art. Ernst Fischer was a Marxist uh, art historian, marvelous writer. It's a book which I strongly recommend, even if you don't agree with his ideas or with Marxism, you will find this a most fascinating book. And therefore, the title of, of my lecture today is, is just that, The Necessity of Art. Now, I repeat, nowadays, most people would not consider art to be necessary something you could take it or leave it. And yet, you see, going back into the remote past, you could argue, and m many people have argued, that art is something so necessary to our species that the origins of our species, of Homo sapiens sapiens, begins with art. Some people have got a slightly different take on that, but I think it's broadly correct. Because the very first origins of our species in the Paleolithic uh, period, you have already art, something which is recognizably clearly art. I'm referring, of course, to cave art, which is a subject which I think you're all more or less acquainted with. You've seen these pictures, you've seen reproductions of these paintings. But the first thing that strikes one is these are extraordinary works, marvelous works of the human intellect and the human soul, if you like to use that uh, expression. But here's a number of interesting paradoxes which relate to cave art. Uh, first of all, of course, it, it is uh, not true that our ancestors lived in caves. That, that, that very often they did not live in caves. And if they did live in caves, then their activities would be confined to the outermost parts, where there's sun and there's air and there's light. Yes, but these cave paintings, if they were just decoration, one would expect to find them in these places, in the outer parts of the cave. Not so. These paintings will be found in the most obscure and darkest and most inaccessible recesses of the cave. There is an image which I would like you to fix in your mind. Just use your imagination for a moment. Just imagine a period in the remote past and a man or a woman, we don't know, it might have been a woman. We have no information about this. But a man or a woman crawling on their belly in a narrow shaft, struggling in absolute darkness towards the light, towards art. What is the meaning of this? This is not, well, whatever it is, it is not just an adornment. It is not just a decoration. It is not the fairy on the Christmas tree. It is something profoundly important to this society, to the whole of society. Another question. What is the content of cave art? Can anyone tell me? What, what's it, what, what is portrayed in these pictures? Anyone? Pardon? Well, life experiences, but very specific life experiences. These paintings are paintings of animals. Animals, think. 
Not a single flower, not a single blade of grass, not a single tree, not a single fruit, only animals. It is true that there are some human figures depicted, but if you look at the figure, here's a curious fact. The animals are beautifully depicted with staggering realism. Personally, I don't think that the depictions of animals have ever been improved upon. These were people who were very well aware of the anatomy of animals, down to the finest details. Beautifully portrayed. And yet the human figures, which are very few, very few of them, are very poorly displayed. They're like matchstick men. They have no art in them. Very strange. So the human being here, the human figure is not important. What is important is the animal. Furthermore, it is not just any animals. It is specific animals. Now we know, for example, from the south, studies of the south of France, the Dordogne area where these marvelous uh, Lascaux paintings were found, we know what, what these people ate. And the animal that was most uh, common as, as meat was the reindeer. Climate was a lot colder at that time. And yet, what is depicted in these paintings is not reindeers, but bisons, wild horses, mammoth elephants. Now, how do you explain this? Well, it, very simply. You see, it is clear that th this art is not just an adornment. It's not just uh, something that's me meant to look uh, pretty. It is for a purpose, and it's for a very serious social purpose, which is, of course, there are different opinions about this, but I have no doubt whatever that at least part of the intention was to gain some kind of power over the animals which are portrayed, which are difficult animals to, to hunt, dangerous animals to hunt, and therefore they require magic in order to be hunted. And there's no question about it that this art somehow is ritual art at a period of human development when art, science, and religion were united. They were one. Here it is art. It's recognizably art. It also has a, a religious, a mystic, a, a ritual element to gain control over these animals. And also, if you like, it's a primitive attempt for human beings to understand and control their environment. So in a sense, we have the embryo also of science and technology here. But whatever, whatever, whichever way you look at it, it is clearly a, a, a collective activity and of great importance to this community. What kind of community are we referring to here? Well, a Marxist would describe our earliest period, and by the way, most of our time on this planet was spent in this society. We would describe this as primitive tribal communism. Here is a society which does not know private property. There's no private property. There is no money. There are no bankers, which uh, probably is a, a very good thing. No bailouts either in the old Stone Age. No family as we would recognize it. it collect there were collective marriages and so on and so forth. Of course, uh, we don't know a lot about the society. There's no writing. And this art also, although we can appreciate it, it can appeal to us aesthetically, we cannot really say that we understand this art. It is a product of a different mindset, a different psychology, a different set of social relationships. These social relationships, which lasted a very long time in our development, suddenly changed about 10 or 12,000 years ago in what was arguably the most important event in human history, the most important revolution, which was named by a great uh, archaeologist, the father of modern archaeology, another Marxist, by the way, the Australian Gordon Child baptized it as the Neolithic Revolution. This is the transition from a hunter-gatherer, primitive tribal society, communist society, to the first form of class society. The Neolithic Re Revolution is the transition to, to agriculture and to, to fixed settlements. It is also accompanied for the first time with the, deve with, with the development of classes of rich and poor, of the state, of armies, of organized religion, of priests, and gods reflecting the new agricultural relationships, and also a fundamental change in the nature of art. Up until this time, art is the, product, is the, is the common property of everybody. 
Everybody participates somehow in this art because everybody participates in the rituals and so on that were the common property of the whole tribe. Now, for the first time, art becomes private property. And it becomes property of the state. And above all, it becomes an expression of organized state religion. You have, for example, the art of Egypt. Very impressive art. Far more impressive, you could say, than the cave paintings which went before it. Yes, but this art is... This art contains a message. You have, for example, if you go to the uh, British Museum, it's not far from here, you will find the head of a pharaoh, a massive head, bigger than, bigger than me, and an arm, also bigger than me. This is a, a gigantic statue of a pharaoh, of a god-king, and this statue is not just a work of art, of course it is a work of art, but it's a work of art with a message. It means something. What is the message? The message is, I am great. I am all-powerful. You are nothing. You, an ordinary human being, are nothing. This is the message. The same message, of course, we will see repeated in other periods of human history. I don't have time to deal with the whole of antiquity. We have the transition from what Marx referred to as the Asian mode of production in Egypt, in India, in Mesopotamia, in Persia. We have some Iranian friends here with us uh, today. Great civilization, of course. But th uh, th these societies produced great art, marvelous art. Look at the Assyrian room in the British Museum. It's wonderful art. Yes, but there's something about this art which, which does not quite satisfy us, satisfy us because it's not quite human. You have the sensation, these statues of gods and so on, they're not really human. Uh, and there's some distance between ourselves and this art. Furthermore, this is static art. It doesn't change very much. For hundreds, maybe thousands of years, it doesn't change very much. The reason for this conservatism is that this is religious art which is dictated to by the priests according to strict ritual. It is anonymous art. I would argue that the, the vast majority of art up until the period of the Renaissance is anonymous. We don't know the names of the artists. These are, it's not important. The artist, this is not, a, this is not a, a free expression of the artist's soul. It is dictated to by the dictates of the state and of uh, religion. Possibly we first begin to feel more at home with art in the period of, of Greece and Rome, which is slave society, that's a new form of society, a new form of, of, of slavery, in which, first of all, we, we first feel that here we, we have art which you can identify with. You go to the British Museum and have a look at the Greek and Roman uh, sculptures. There is a wonderful Greek, well, it is a Greek sculpture, but it's a Roman imitation. The original has been lost, unfortunately. But here is a, a, a picture of a depiction of a woman, of Aphrodite, the goddess of love, having a bath, very sexy. And you feel it's not, how can this be stone? How can, how can such, such a thing be expressed by stone? You feel as if you touch this flesh, it, it, it will feel warm to the touch. It is such a wonderful depiction of the human form. And yet all of these marvelous discoveries of, of culture, of literature, of art, of architecture in Rome and in Greece were based on something which we would, found, we would find today to be absolutely abhorrent. They were all based upon slavery. All this wonderful culture was based upon the work, the drudgery, the suffering of thousands and tens of thousands of slaves, which the Romans referred to with a very graphic expression, instrumentum vocale, a tool with a voice. All of our culture is based upon slavery. That's an important point to, to, to grasp. And yet, despite the horrors of slavery, human civilization did advance. One would have to say that this was definitely a step forward. It was definitely an advance. But of course, it reached its limits. Now, the, there is an idea present in society, more than, idea, more than an idea, it is a prejudice. 
And the prejudice is something like this. Perhaps some of you, maybe hopefully, might uh, decide at the end of this lecture to suddenly become a revolutionary Marxist and fight to change the world. If that's the case, I'd be delighted, of course. But if you would go home, go home to your mother and father and say, well, I've decided to be a revolutionary and change the world, I can just imagine the conversation. It would go something like this. No, 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 don't be a fool. Don't be stupid. You can't change the world. You can't change society. You cannot change human nature. I thought that when I was your age, but I've, I've, got, I've got older and wiser and I've realized it's not possible. Incidentally, don't you believe somebody that says that they're older and wiser? I know quite a few people that get older and more stupid. That, that's, that's, another, uh, that's another argument. But what about this argument that you cannot change human nature? The argument is, is patently false because so-called human nature has changed many times in the course of history. Although people resist this, they don't understand, they can't, people don't like change, they don't like the idea of change. You can even see this in the cinema, in Hollywood, there's a film called The Flint, Flintstones. You know The Flintstones? Anybody? Put your hands up, those that know The Flintstones. Ah, so I'm not completely out of date. Now here, here's an interesting, here's a film about a society one million years ago in which there's private property, and there's money, and there's banks, and there's prisons, and there's the state, and there's the bourgeois family in which the husband naturally is oppressed by the wife. In other words, just like now, just like today. Now, before you say anything else, I do understand that this is meant to be funny. This is meant to be a joke. And yet, and yet, and yet, people believe this. People really believe that society has never, has never changed, it's always been the same, people have the same. Which, of course, is entirely false. If you look at human history, if it was to be represented as a clock, a 24-hour clock, then you would find that for the first, uh, what should we say, 22 hours, our ancestors lived in a society without money, without property, without the state, without the family as we know it, and they lived quite happily in these conditions. Then at a certain stage you have the Neolithic Revolution, you have the growth of class society which changes everything. And it changes art and it changes the role of art. Art is no longer the common property of the whole of society, but it's the property of a small privileged minority. Now I'm not saying whether this is good or bad, it's not a moralistic question, but it's a simple statement of fact. The truth is that this development of class society did push civilization forward. There's no question about it. But it pushed civilization forward at the cost of the majority, at the cost of the slaves, at the cost of the, as the Bible says, the hewers of wood and the drawers of water. And art now becomes the monopoly of the ruling class. Culture becomes the monopoly of the ruling class. Aristotle, who's a, perhaps the most profound philosopher of, of antiquity, put it in the following way in his marvelous book, the, the Metaphysics. He said, man begins to philosophize when the needs of life are provided. Marvelous, profound expression. And he goes on. Consequently, mathematics and astronomy were discovered in Egypt because the priests did not have to work. Marvelous expression. If, you, if you're genuinely free, if you're free from slavery, if you don't have to work, then you can spend your time looking at the skies and looking at the stars. You can predict, for example, when the Nile is going to overflow flow its back. This gives you power. Knowledge is power. And power now becomes a monopoly of the ruling class. What you'll also find, if you look at the uh, human history, incidentally, capitalism, which is the, city, the, the society that we live in now, has only existed for about the last two minutes on this clock. It's only existed for 200 years. So the idea that everything we have in this society is something which is natural, which is a reflection of human nature, is entirely false. On the contrary, what you'll find if you draw, uh, a, shall we say, a, a graph of the last 12,000 years, you will find different societies, like the Asiatic mode of production, which rises and falls. Slave society, Greece and Rome, which rises and falls. Feudal society, which rises and falls, and now, of course, capitalism, which has risen, and I think it's a fair assumption to say, also will enter into its 
phase of decline. It's like ourselves. We are born, we flourish, we develop, we reach maturity, and then we reach a certain point, very sadly in our life, where we, get, we begin the slow process of decline. It is the same with socio-economic systems, and art reflects this. Art does reflect, not directly, indirectly, the class struggle within society, the contradictions within society, the development of society. It is, it is somehow reflected on that. I hope to dem give, you, give you one or two examples of this. Uh, after the collapse of the Roman Empire, there was a period of barbarism in Europe which lasted about a thousand years. I know it's not, it's not, it's not um, fashionable to say that now. It's fashionable to say the barbarians were an okay bunch, you know. They were greatly, Attila the Hun was a greatly misunderstood uh, chap. And the Vikings were really just peaceful tourists from Sweden who came here to trade peaceably with... You know, if you can believe that, you can believe anything, you know. Just one uh, little illustration as to the way in which society was thrown back. Incidentally, be warned. Society has got an ascending line. Civilization has an ascending line. It also has a descending line. And in my view, civilization now is seriously threatened. We are threatened with barbarism in this very period, at this very moment that I'm speaking, but that's a separate subject. With the collapse of Rome, let me give you just one indication. 1,000 years later, the best roads in Europe were Roman roads. The art of road building was lost, along with the art of uh, bricklaying was lost. Society was thrown back, culture was thrown back. Art in the Middle Ages is as sterile as you could imagine, in Western Europe, that is. We were saved by the Islamic world, as a matter of fact. We were saved by the Arabs. The Arabs saved, in Spain in particular, the Arabs saved Western uh, culture and gave it back to us in an even more developed form. But we were just barbarians here. And the art of the Middle Ages is ster sterile art, it is static art, it is religious art, again, controlled by the, the priest caste. This only changes, it only be begins to break down in the later Middle Ages with the breakdown of the feudal system and the rise of capitalism, which coincides with two great events. The Reformation, which is a great religious change, and the Renaissance. I said this morning, perhaps the most wonderful period of blossoming of culture that you could imagine in the whole of history. But what I wanted to point out to you is that art is revolutionary by nature. And what the artist is seeking to do really is not just to portray reality, but to show us that, 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 that there is something better to strive for than the dreary, monotonous grind of everyday existence. That there is something more, that are broader horizons which humanity has been struggling for ever since the days when we were struggling on our bellies in a dark cave, striving towards what? Striving towards art, striving for something better, something higher than normal, everyday, mundane, monotonous existence. Now, you see, in, in, the, in the latter period of, of feudalism, you have a period in Europe known as the period of the absolute monarchies. Here is a hierarchical society. Fra France is a good example. France, on the eve of the French Revolution, the mass of the people are poor peasants living in dirt poverty, oppressed, exploited. And then you have the court at the pinnacle of society. Louis XIV, Louis XV, Louis XVI, and their respective wives, mistresses and courtiers who live in a different planet. Just like the bankers today live on a different planet. They live in a different universe from the rest of us. They think differently. They live differently. They act differently. Here's an extreme example of the where you get the ruling class entirely separated from society. Art also is entirely separated from society. And the conception of these people is that this was going to go on forever. They always think this. It will last forever. Adolf Hitler talked about the thousand-year Reich. didn't last a thousand years. It didn't even last just over a decade. However, they've all got these delusions of grandeur. And uh, the French monarchy had these ideas. Let me give you an example. Even such a thing, I suppose it's a form of art, as gardening. 
Have you been, any of you been to the gardens of Versailles? If you haven't been, you must have seen pictures of it. Yes, somebody's been. How would you describe these gardens? Give me one word. Grand, grand yeah. Another word. Very grand. And another word. Geometrical, right? It's absolutely straight lines. Everything in perfect. Yes, but nature is not like that, is it? Nature is wild. Nature is free. Nature is anarchic. It's chaotic. These gardens are nature under complete control by the state, by the monarchy, every class in its place, every person in his or her place, leading up to the pinnacle. In these gardens, brother, Marie Antoinette, the Austrian woman, the wife of Louis XVI, played games. They had plays with music and so on, in which she would usually dress up as a shepherdess and have beautiful love stories with a shepherd, you know, with nice pink frilly dresses and so on. Of course, that's not much to do with the real French shepherd. And the real French shepherdess who was starving and living in huts and dressed in rags. This is the degree to which art and uh, culture so becomes entirely separated from reality. It becomes unreal. But this unreal world was burst apart. Suddenly, without warning, nobody expected this. It was like a thunderbolt from a clear blue sky in July 1789 when the people of France rose up and carried through one of the most glorious events in human history, the French Revolution. People are a bit frightened of the word revolution. All that a revolution is is a fundamental change in society. Society reaches to the point where it cannot, cannot con continue as it has done and the change is necessary and the change is brought about. Of course, nowadays it's got a very bad name. I did a program on the History Channel about five years ago. Some people came from America and had interviewed me in the Wallace Collection about the French Revolution, and they were very nice people, very honest people. But they were astounded at what I had to say. It was the French Revolution. Was it really worthwhile, they said. It was all blood and guts and stuff like this. And yet, just think for a moment about the words of one of our greatest English poets. William Wordsworth was a young man. He went to France in, in 1792. You know what he wrote? It's in his work, The Prelude. He said, bliss t'was in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. William Wordsworth. With those few lines, you can sense the feeling of colossal liberation and emancipation that this revolution had aroused enormous hopes. What was the reflection of the French Revolution in art? It had a very profound repercussion in art, in literature, in philosophy, for the whole of Europe, in poetry. All the greatest English and Scottish poets, Rabbi Burns, my hero, ordinary working man who became a, a, ma a marvelous poet, all were inspired by the vision of a people that decided to fight for freedom and take its destinies into its own head. No matter what is said about anything else, it was a colossal act of social emancipation, which inspired, it changed art. Now, in a sense, the art and revolution are a little bit contradictory. Why do I say this? Because when people are fighting for their lives, Art really, unfortunately, you could say it takes a second place, but it must take a second seat. The great drama is not fought out on the stage or on the television screen, it's fought out on the streets and on the battlefields. And therefore, in a sense, the, the sound of battle tends to drown out the voice, the weak voice of the artist, and yet it has an effect. There was a very great artist, a painter. Let's deal with painting first. You deal with the painting of the old regime, of the aristocracy. You can see it, that the paintings, and they're marvelous paintings as far as it goes, of Fragonard or Boucher. But they're completely decadent in the sense, here are pictures, wonderful erotic pictures of uh, scantily clad uh, young ladies prancing around on beds for the decoration of aristocratic bedrooms. Or of, uh, Fragonard's wonderful picture of, of the, the, sw the swing, which you can see in the Wallace collection. Again, frilly dresses and uh, nymphs and shepherds and all this kind of stuff. And of course, Rome. 
it, 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 the pictures are from Roman uh, antiquity. Now, the, the great painter of the French Revolution was a man called David. He also took as his uh, subjects mainly Roman history. Yes, but it's a different Rome. It's a different Rome and it's different history. The old regime deals with the Roman Empire. David deals with the Roman Republic. It's austere painting. It's dramatic painting. It's heroic painting. It's saying to the people, we've got to stand up and fight, like the ancient Romans stood up and, and, and fought for their, for their freedom. And it entered the world of music. I realize music is not the domain of, of perhaps this particular school, but nevertheless, we, it's all a form of art. Classical music, so-called, again, was neat. Sonata form, all the same. You know, you may like it, you may dislike it, but it was all very neatly arranged, very pleasant. Music for aristocrats, largely speaking, I might be, I'm being a bit unkind here, is the kind of music that you could hum to, or you go away cheerfully away from the country, you sing, the, sing a little tune, or fall asleep quietly during one of these symphonies. And along comes a great, perhaps the greatest of all composer, inspired by the French Revolution with fire in his belly, Ludwig van Beethoven. And his third symphony, the Eroica Symphony, begins, I don't have the thing, but it begins like this. I hope I don't break something. Bang! Bang! And then it takes off like a cavalry charge. That, those two opening chords remind me of a French revolutionary orator banging the table and demanding attention. The first movement of Beethoven's The Heroic Symphony is, 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 is as, as long as any symphony by Mozart or Haydn. Entirely different. A revolution in music. It, it shocked people. Art, great art and great music has the power to shock. You know, there's a wonderful art cricket. I don't much like cri uh, critics. But there's one serious art critic uh, today, Robert Hughes, the, the Australian, marvellous. Uh, I don't know if you've, you know his book, The Sock of the New. Do you know this book? If you don't, please read it. It's a wonderful book. And uh, he says quite clearly, great art must have the power to shock. You may like it or you may dislike it, but you must not be indifferent. Indifference is the death of art. You cannot be indifferent to, 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 to great art. Nowadays, I, I fear that most people are quite indifferent to art which tells us something about the state which art has, has found itself in. It wasn't always the case. A Beethoven shocked the world. He was a subversive. He was a revolutionary. You must have all heard Beethoven's symphony. The opening was, dun, 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 dun. This is that man battering on the door of history, you know. This is great. This has got music, it's got power to shock. Nicholas Arnantour, the great conductor, the, the Dutch conductor, actually said, this is not music, this is political agitation. This music is saying to us, this world is no good, this society is no good, let's go, let's change it. Other artists were, were affected. Incidentally, while, while, while we're dealing with Beethoven's third symphony, it's subtitled the Eroica, the heroic symphony. It was supposed to be dedicated to Napoleon Bonaparte because Beethoven admired the French Revolution and looked forward to a revolution in his own country and admired Napoleon Bonaparte until he found out, he got the, the word while he was writing the symphony, that Napoleon Bonaparte had betrayed the revolution and crowned himself as emperor. Whereupon Beethoven was disgusted and said, so he also is just only a man. And he scratched out the dedication to Napoleon Bonaparte and he wrote in its place, to a hero, to the memory of a hero, the Eroica Symphony. You know, the manuscript, for you to see how art and music is connected with life and connected with the revolution, this manuscript still exists. You find it in Vienna. And if you look at this manuscript, if you look where he crossed out this dedication, he crossed it out with such fury that he tore a hole in the page. A great revolutionary and a great, possibly the greatest composer, I would say, of all times. Let's take another artist, which I consider to be one of the greatest of all times, which I strongly recommend to you. You would need to go to the Prado Museum in Madrid. I'm referring to Goya. I think one of the most fantastic artists that ever lived. And here is art that is relevant. Here is art that reflects the, the human condition, 
Somebody mentioned that the phrase earlier on. In the most dramatic way possible. And by the way, there's not one Goya. There are two Goyas. The Goya of the first period painted pictures, beautiful pictures, of elegant young ladies and men dancing, blue skies, the sun is always shining. Then suddenly there's a change. Napoleon's armies invaded Spain. A brutal, bloody war began. Guerrilla war, that's where the word comes from, guerrilla. Guerrilla is a small war. Subsequently, the, 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 the French were driven out, but unfortunately, the, the monarchy returned, the Spanish monarchy, with the Inquisition, with blood and iron and all the dreams, because Goya was, a, like Beethoven, was a liberal. He was a revolutionary. He wanted change in Spain. He wanted democracy and liberty in Spain. All these dreams were shattered in the cruelest possible way with the return of absolutism, secret police, torture, trials, the Inquisition. And Goya died a bitter, very bitter old man, isolated. I think he was deaf like Beethoven. And deafness is a terrible form of isolation. He painted his last paintings on the wall of a small house in France, on the plaster. These were not meant for people to see. These were not meant for, 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 for money or for fame. He was pouring out what was inside himself, what was in his... This is true art. Where the artist, without any external pressure, without any, any corruption or bribery or seeking after riches, pours out the inner contents of his or her soul. Goya's black period. Now here is the most astonishing art. The most modern art. Art that really shocks. It is black. It is literally black. The earlier period, the skies are sunny, the sun is always shining, the skies are blue. Here the sky is black, permanently black. Here you have a picture of a mass of some kind of fluid or mud or vomit. It's the color of vomit. And the sky is the color of vomit of a dog. You just see the dog's head and the dog is drowning in this mess. Or two men hitting each other with, with cudgels, killing each other, and they're also sinking. Here are pictures of devils and demons and witches. It is a nightmare. It is a nightmare expressed in art. Yes, but this nightmare was what was actually happening in Goya's own country. There is a wonderful collection of etchings called Los Desastres de la Guerra, the disasters of war. More uh, uh, pictures of a greater impact, greater, a greater condemnation of human cruelty and war you could not imagine. Goya, a great artist. Why a great artist? Because on the one hand, he's expressing what is in himself. This is true art. This is not prostitution. This is true art. At the same time, he's expressing a general reality, a truth which is a universal truth. He's expressing the period in which he lives. You know, I wish we had a Goya today that was capable of expressing the dilemma which our world face, faces. Instead of that, what do you get? An unmade bed? Does this really express the full drama of the human race at the, end of the, at the beginning of the 20, 21st century? Well, I have a reasonable doubt. Or a shark pickled in formaldehyde. What does this express? What universal truth does this say? I think it just says a very simple thing. I am a shark pickled in formaldehyde. I don't think this tells us a very great deal. However, it does earn somebody a lot of money. It does earn somebody a very great deal of money. And this is not meant to be tucked away in a small hut. It is meant to be sold for large amounts of cash on the market. And yet, you know, art was not always like that, not even in our own times. We have a great artist, uh, Pablo Picasso. Pablo Picasso was a successful artist. Unlike Van Gogh, again a marvelous artist who died in absolute sheer poverty. Now his paintings are being sold for millions of pounds. The man died in poverty. Or uh, Vermeer, whose wife had to sell his very few precious paintings for, to the baker to buy bread. Now his paintings are items of speculation, earning vast fortunes for a number of people. You might say to me, no, but Alan, look, be fair. In the past, 
that have been wealthy people that have given money to artists and helped artists. So what's wrong with this? Yes, but you know there's a difference. The Medici during the Renaissance were bandits in the very literal sense of the word. But it is true they were bandits with very good artistic taste. You know, they loved art. It is true, they loved art. And they promoted people such as Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo. They loved art. Nowadays, art is a form of prostitution on a vast scale. Nowadays, people go to an art market, not because they love art, but because art is one commodity more. Just the same as underpants or uh, rubber tires or television sets or anything else, or oil, or coconuts. It's a commodity to be bought and sold, and it is prostitution on a vast scale. Works of art are, are purchased by big companies, big capitalist companies, as items of speculation. They are purchased by anonymous buyers from Japan over the telephone, Japan or New York, whatever. For what purpose? To be appreciated? No, they're not appreciated. They are locked away in bank vaults where human eyes will never see them again. Humanity is thus deprived of access to works of great artistic values. The museums can no longer keep up. The art guy, Robert Hughes makes this point very forcibly in an excellent television pro program that he made recently called uh, The Goya, no, what was it called? The Mona Lisa Curse. The Mona Lisa Curse. I don't know if you saw that on Channel 4. Marvelous program in which he debunked all, all this, uh, this business. Art has become prostituted and uh, uh, commercialized to the extent that it ceases to be art. It's just a commodity. Goya's paintings. He, the man died in star but almost of starvation. Uh, sold now for millions. To be hidden away as items of speculation. Pure speculation. Now, I ask you, what has this activity got in common with art? With true art, whereby the artist should be free to express himself, uh, freely express uh, what is inside himself or what is, what is inside herself. I, I answer, it has nothing in common. It is a complete degeneration. It is a complete abomination and reflects the values of this society. You know, I said earlier that this pharaoh, this statue of pharaoh gives us a message. I am big, I am powerful, you are nothing. Yes, but we have our modern pharaohs. They're not god kings. They know no religion. The only religion that they know is capital. It's got dollar signs on it. And yet it says the same thing, that you are nothing. In this uh, hall today, I have no doubt, I've never met you before, you've never met me, but I have no doubt that the... It may well be that among you, there are people with, men and women with a great artistic potential. That if you have the chance and the opportunity, you could maybe become a modern Goya or a modern Picasso. Unfortunately, what you will find is that the art world is part of the money world and is well integrated into the money world and therefore you live under a, under, under a dictatorship just as absolute in its own way as the old dictatorship of the church or the Egyptian pharaohs or of Joseph Stalin or of Adolf Hitler. It is not a visible dictatorship, but it's the power of money which dominates all of our lives and dictates whether or not you'll have a job, whether or not you'll have a house. Millions of people are now being evicted from the houses in the States. This affects art. Unfortunately, art no longer has the power to shock. It no longer has this, at least the official art, what is accepted, the Damien Hirsts and people of that, uh, the Jeff Koons and people of that character. It has become trivial. It is irrelevant. And it is seen as trivial and irrelevant by the great majority of society and by serious artists an increasing number have come to this conclusion. This is a complete dead end. I was going to mention Pablo Picasso. During the Spanish Civil War, in which one million people were killed, I have some quite a lot of personal experience of uh, Spain. Of the, uh, I participated in the struggle against the Frank Franco dictatorship in the 1970s. But nevertheless, Spain, again, is a country with enormous artistic traditions. 
And here you have a man like Picasso, who spent most of his life in exile. There was an incident in 1937 in which uh, Hitler, supporting Franco's armies, firebombed the small town of Guernica in the Basque country. It had no military va value, there was no base there, there were no guns there, there were no soldiers, just ordinary men, women and kids in a, in a busy market day, buying their necessities, their food and so on and so forth. They dropped bombs on Guernica and entirely liquidated it as an act of pure terrorism, of pure terror, state terror. And Pablo Picasso reacted as one would expect a great artist to react by producing his great masterpiece, Guernica, which you probably have seen in reproduction. You go to Madrid, you can see it. I believe it's still in Madrid. There's plans to move it to Bilbao, but I don't think they've done that. Here is an astonishing depiction of the horrors of war in the tradition of Goya. Here you have a bull, a mad bull, a savage bull out of, out of control. Here you have a horse penetrated by a lance. A, 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 a mother with a dead baby in her arms howling to the, to the heavens, the dumb heavens, of course, which can't hear or do anything about it. Here's an astonishing, powerful picture of the horrors of war and the barbarism of fascism. This is great art. And I repeat, why is it great? It is great because it's, it's not propaganda, by the way. But propaganda cannot be great art. This is not political propaganda. This is a cry from the soul, a cry from the heart of a man that's committed to what? Committed not to a political party necessarily, committed to humanity, committed to the cause of progress against fascism, committed to the side of the workers and peasants of Spain against this fascist barbarism. Yes, it is an intensely personal declaration, but it's a personal declaration which means something for the majority of, of humanity. Now again, I, I would compare that, which is great art, to the present lamentable state, what is known as, as Brit art. I want to make it clear that I am in favor of complete freedom for artists. Art must be free. But it must be free of all forms of tutelage and dictatorship, not just religious censorship and political censorship, but also the insidious dictatorship of finance, of capital, whereby in effect the artist, the young artist like yourself, is expropriated because you have no access, no automatic access to the galleries, to the auction rooms, to the recording studios. These are not in your hands, they're in the hands of other people who consider art, music, and literature as a, an element of commerce and a, a way of getting rich. Now what conclusions should we, should we draw from this? Well, I, I think myself that first of all, to return to my original uh, title for this lecture, art is necessary or rather it ought to be necessary. What is life without color, without music, without poetry? And actually many people, millions of people, although they say, well, I'm not interested in art, and yet they watch television, they watch soap operas, this is a kind of drama, they listen to music. These are forms of art. I'm not saying whether it's good art or bad, or bad art, but it is, these are forms of art. And people become passionate about this. They go to the cinema, they become passionate about films. Why? Because this art, for a moment, takes them out of the, of the dreary, monotonous, boring, every existence, and shows them that something else is possible, that there is something else. This is magic art. Ernest Fisher said quite correctly, art is magic. Art was magic in its origins, as I tried to explain at the beginning. Art and magic, were the, and art still has this potential for, for, for magic. It is something in common with religion, except that myself, I stand here as a declared, avowed Marxist and materialist, and therefore an irreconcilable atheist. I don't offend anybody's religious sentiments, if you have any, but as far as I'm concerned, anyone can, anyone can believe whatever they want. All I would say is this, I don't understand religion. 
as far as I understand what the Christian church says, is that you must be good. And what, what we mean by good? Well, the priest means that you must accept, you see. For example, if you're a capitalist and the boss robs you and exploits you, just, just accept. Thank you very much. Let's have some more. If you're a, a wife and your husband beats you and tortures you, just turn the other cheek. And if you do this, if you suffer all your life and you accept all the impositions and you're very good and you meekly and humbly submit and so on, if you're good, then you'll be all right, you'll be very happy, you'll have a wonderful time when you're dead. <laughs> I never understood this. Let me, let me put a different uh, perspective to you. You only live once. We only live once. There is only one life. There is only one world, this marvelous, beautiful, physical, material world that we're privileged to live in. So should we not then strive to make this life worth living because we won't have another one? Should we make it, uh, this planet worth living in, a, a place fit for men and women? This is what socialism is about. This is what the struggle for revolution is about. And art is part of this. Because art shares with religion this, and it gives us an idea that something could be better, that life could be better. There's more to life than just the drudgery, the working long hours of overtime to survive, or worrying about humiliating things like, will I have a house, or will I have a, a school for my kids, and stuff like that. I go back to this marvelous phrase of Aristotle 2,300 years ago. Man begins to philosophize when the needs of life are provided. What's this got to do with art? Nowadays, art is considered to be irrelevant by most people. Irrelevant. They're not interested in it. And it's increasingly alienated. It's nothing to do. It doesn't say anything to anybody anymore. There was a time when it did. I believe that we should fight for a new society in which the majority of people will take their own destiny into their own hands. That's what a revolution means. People must take their fate into their own hands. In which art will play the role which it should always have played. After all, think of this. So far, people have, have their lives. Here's my life and here is art. And the two never meet. On the contrary, in a genuine source of society, art must be f part of life. And after all, the greatest art of all is life itself. Why should art be separated? Trotsky, the Russian revolutionary, once said, he compared art galleries to concentration camps. He said, look, all these beautiful works of art, they're locked up in a concentration camp. It is separate from life. People live, in, I know some of my friends from, a, from Iran want to study Architecture. Architecture is probably the most neglected of all the arts. And yet it's potentially the most important. We live in houses, don't we, most of us? Yes, we live in ugly houses, in ugly streets, in ugly, badly designed cities, which are monstrous in human places. We work in ugly workplaces. Work has nothing to do with us. We're alienated from work. It doesn't fulfill us. You're studying here. It's a good thing that you study. Will you get a job at the end of it? Or rather, will you get a job which you want to, to do? Will you, will you be able to practice art? Will you be able to practice architecture? The answer should be yes, because we need artists, we need architects above all. Unfortunately, the way things are going, there's plenty of room for bankers, but there's not much room for artists, doctors, teachers, professors, things which are really necessary to, 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 this, to this world. I'll just finish on one note. Religion promises us a paradise beyond the grave. This paradise does not exist. Why should not men and women fight and realize a paradise in this world? A paradise in this life. Don't we have the means for this? Don't we have the science? Don't we have the technology? There is no objective reason for anyone to starve to death in this world. They say, oh, it's not enough food. Nonsense. There's no reason why any child should die for the lack of clean water. Eight million people starve to death every year. 1.2 billion people live on one dollar a day. Why? There's no objective reason why that should be the case. We have the means in our hands to effectuate the fundamental change in society. The trouble is, the only trouble is, that these colossal means of production are in a few hands 
in private hands and dedicated exclusively to the profits of a minority and not to the needs of the human race. You know, the human race has got a wonderful history of solving its problems. Humanity can solve its problems. And art can play a big role. Architecture will play a big role. I believe in the future you could even have political parties based on, our, uh, based on architecture, discussing democratically how we should solve the problems of the cities which are choked up with traffic and fumes and pollution and carbon emissions and all the rest of it. This must be solved democratically. This means that power must pass from the hands of a privileged minority into the hands of the majority of working men and women in Britain and on a world scale. Once that occurs, by the way, it will be possible very quickly to satisfy the needs of people. See, socialism isn't about a crust of bread. You know, it's true, it starts with that. Everyone should have a job, everyone should have a house, everyone should have their basic needs met. Yes, but that's only the starting point. The real aim is not that the real aim is, the real aim is to free people from a humiliating psychology of material dependence and worry and concern, such that they can do, each individual can develop themselves freely. Socialism, to quote Frederick Engels, is mankind's leap from the realm of necessity to the realm of freedom. And when we attain such a society, which with your assistance I believe we will succeed, then art will become once again a necessary part of human life, a way in which people can seek to improve themselves, to no longer be concerned about the humiliating grind of existence, to raise their eyes to the stars and to really create a paradise in this world. Thank you. Never forget Maram died for your sins. Praise be to Zogashi's name.